Okay, so, um... Oh, Nima's kind of a hard act to follow. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess you should forget about cosmological constant, LHC, and topics. I'm going to tell you about something really important instead. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and this is vortices. <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of into vortices. Um, and that, there is a good reason. And I actually think vortices are, are possibly the most ubiquitous object in all of physics. And they're one of the few ideas that really stretches across all, all areas of physics. Uh, in cosmology, the idea that cosmic strings may stretch across the sky has really been a, a dominant theme for the past 20 years. Uh, down the hall in Eric Cornell's laboratory, they're studying vortices in rotating BECs. Uh, the people here who I know are working on topological string theory, if you compute Robert Whitten invariants, it's really all about computing vortices. Uh, engaging these signal models. Um, so they really are something that, that's kind of important. What I want to do in today's lecture, and actually for the next two lectures, is tell you about um, a new way that you can understand um, the strongly coupled behavior of four-dimensional gauge theories by studying the way that vortex strings uh, oscillate. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of, uh, give you a little bit of history that you, that you already know. So, uh, some history. dates back to uh, the year I was born. So D equals 3 plus 1 SUN gauge theories. And of course, what was discovered about these theories in 1973 uh, by Gross, Wilczek, Pollitz, uh, Coleman, others, uh, was that, um, oh, let me write down Lagrangian first, So we take just the yang mills theory, and we're going to couple them to a bunch of fermions, and I'll explain exactly what kind of fermionic content we're going to have later. And of course, what was learned in that year was that uh, these theories have asymptotic freedom, that if you plot uh, the gauge coupling constant against the energy scale mu, then it decreases at large energies, and at some finite energy scale, lambda QCD, it diverges and you get this famous dimensional representation. <laughs> okay, so when people uh, first understood this, um, it's clear that what we really want to do to understand QCD is understand it in the, the strong coupling regime, and this is still a problem now, more than 30 years later. So, so what did people do when they first realized that, that things were growing in the infrared and becoming strongly coupled? Well, they do what we always do when we're presented with a difficult problem, which is that you go away and you solve a completely different problem, and then you try and convince people that might have something to do with what you were originally interested in. So, they looked at toy models, and one of uh, the most compelling toy models that, that shared many of these properties uh, was in one plus one dimensions. And Signal model in, in one plus one dimensions, and in particular, a model that seems to capture many, uh, much of the, the physics of QCD is uh, CP n minus one signal model in one plus one dimensions. Okay, so what's this, this model? There's a coupling constant R, which is dimensionless, just like E squared in QCD. Okay, so alpha here goes from 0 to 1 instead of the mu index, which of course goes from 0 to 3. Uh, the i index goes from 0 to n, and there's a constraint on these scalar fields. So, so this is the bosonic CPN model here, and, uh, and these are some fermions. And again, I'm going to explain exactly what sort of fermion content a little later in these lectures. So we subject these to the constraints that the sum over the phi i squares is equal to 1. And if you rotate all the phi i's by a phase, you, uh, you identify the configurations that are related to this. OK, so n complex variables uh, phi i subject to this constraint divided by this u1 action defines the manifold of CPN. So, so hopefully most of you have seen CPN in some form. If you haven't, think of it as the complex version of the sphere. In, in n dimensions. It's a homogeneous manifold that has an SUN symmetry acting on it rather than the 
SO end of a, of a sphere. And by acting with SUN, you can get from any point on this manifold. Okay. okay, and the thing that immediately made people pay attention was that if you plot, well, so, so R here is, if you rescale things, R is essentially the volume of the CPN, or the size of uh, the CPN. So if you look at a small patch, uh, this manifold, th th this, uh, this theory is essentially free, where the patch you have to look at has to be much smaller than uh, the size of the CPN. So when R is very big, the theory is free, and when R gets smaller and smaller, the theory gets more strongly coupled. This is just the same with the alpha prime group. OK, so if you look at R in this, in this model, then the theory is asymptotically free, meaning that R gets bigger and uh, bigger in the ultraviolet, and the theory and the manifold gets smaller and smaller in the infrared, until eventually R diverges at some scale, which is, is lambda C. OK. So although these two theories look very different, they really have a lots of things in common. Uh, the first thing they have, as I've just shown there, is asymptotic freedom. They have a dynamically generated mass gap. Meaning that in both theories, I started purely with massless fields and quantum effects dynamically generated mass for them. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things they also have in common, some of which I'll touch on in the next lecture. They both have anomalies. They both have instantons. They both have chiral symmetry breaking. They both have confinement in certain situations, although the confinement in both cases depends, depends crucially on what the fermion content is. They have other solitons, they have large N expansions. And there's a whole bunch of other things. Okay, so as far as toy models go, so this isn't bad. She has many of the features of QCD. She has lots of things that, that uh, there's lots of things they don't have in common, for example, the dimension of uh, space time in both, which sort of suggests that. Maybe this isn't such an interesting model for QCD. So what I'd like to do in um, uh, the next two lectures is tell you that there's actually not just this qualitative link between the CP and Sigma model and Yang-Mills theories, but really a quantitative link, meaning that for every kind of uh, uh, SUN gauge theory with particular matter content that you can write down here, there's a corresponding CP and Sigma model or some variant of this. And you can actually compute things in the two-dimensional CPN model, which give you the exact answers for the four-dimensional gauge theory. So you can use the CPN sigma model to calculate things in four-dimensional gauge theory, an exact map between correlation functions. And the link between these uh, two different theories is the vortex string. So it's, uh, it's a soliton that lives in the four-dimensional theory. So the claim is that there exists a quantitative map between 4D gauge theories and 2D sigma models and the link between these two things is the vortex screen. Okay, the basic idea is that we're going to look at these theories, we're going to deform them uh, in a particular way. They're going to admit a soliton, which is a vortex string. The fluctuations of that vortex string are going to be defined by a, um, a theory of this type. And again, there's going to be certain things, at least in supersymmetric theories, that you can compute in this world sheet theory of the vortex <coughs> string that will give you exact results about that four dimensional gauge. Okay, so that's the plan. I'm going to um, spend the next three lectures doing this. The basic idea is today just to tell you some very, very basic things uh, about vortices. So not really um, focusing on this idea, but just to tell you basic ideas about the nielsen olsen vortex, interactions, fermion zero modes, uh, classic stuff from the 70s and 80s. Then in the following two lectures, I'm going to study the quantum dynamics 
of the vortex strings and explain to you various things about how you quantize sigma models in two dimensions, uh, when you get confinement, when you don't, how supersymmetry changes things. Uh, again, some classic stuff and, and some new stuff. Okay, so that, that's the plan. Uh, are there any questions about what I'm going to do before I do it? All happy? <laughs> Okay, so let me start very, in a very basic fashion. The, the next two lectures are going to be independent from each other, but both of them are going to need the results from this lecture. Um, so I'm going to go kind of slowly to make sure I'm happy with what's going on. So if, if you've seen it all before, I'm sorry, but hopefully there'll be a few things uh, that are new for everybody. Okay, so let's start just with the abelian Higgs model. So this is a four-dimensional theory, a U1 gauge field plus a charged scalar for the Maxwell term. For the charged scalar Q, and you just have some quartic coupling. following form. Uh, I've got a couple of parameters in the game. I've got V squared, which is going to be the bed of the Q. And I call this a rather strange combination. I've put an E squared in front of here. I needn't have done. I could have just absorbed it in the coupling lambda. But you'll see why this is, uh, this is the interest, uh, the, the correct way to, to write things shortly. OK, so the vacuum is obviously that Q gets an expectation value. The Higgs mechanism kicks in. The photon gets massive. The mass of the photon is e squared v squared, and the mass squared of q is lambda e squared v squared. So the theory has a mass gap, it only has two massive particles, there's nothing massless. Of course, this is just the Landau-Ginsberg model to, to describe a superconductor. Uh, what's interesting for us is that this, uh, this theory also has another object, which is, uh, is a vortex. Uh, string. So the system has vortex strings, and these are supported Q at infinity. Okay, so the, the string is going to be a soliton, which is uh, um, it's a co dimension two object, so it, it's string like. And Q has to take, the modulus of Q has to be V at infinity, but the phase can change as you, as you move around the plane at infinity. So the phase can be plus one over there, pi over there, minus one over here minus i over there, but then as you go in, the string is going to have something of an identity crisis. By the time you get, get to the middle, it doesn't know what to be, so the only thing it can possibly be is, is zero. So in the middle of the string, the Q field has to dip to zero. If the Q field dips to zero, you see you gain a potential energy uh, uh, from this, so there's got to be some lump of energy in the middle, uh, and that's the vortex. Okay. So this is the R direction. So asymptotically in this, this plane, the x1, x2 plane, the Q field is going to, to wind in this way. And as I said, you must have Okay, you must have uh... <laughs> Uh, no, they, 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 they change somewhere over the middle of the Atlantic. Um, 
Okay, so you must have q differences there. Now, the fact that q winds at infinity, together with the requirement that you want finite energy of this configuration, already guarantees this is a vortex string, which has some magnetic gauge flux going through. Okay? And the way that argument works is, is the following. Because q goes to e to the i theta v at infinity, It means that the kinetic term for Q picks up a contribution from this, from this angular winding. Okay? And the contribution goes as 1 over R squared, or infinity times squared. However, if I was to plug 1 over R squared into here and integrate over the plane, I've got an integral of d2R, 1 over R squared, which is logarithmic to divergent as, a, as I go to infinity. So trying to keep Q winding at infinity means I've got a logarithmic and divergent energy. That's going to be a problem. We're only really interested in, uh, in objects that have finite energy or at least finite energy density. And the trick is to realize that it's not the derivative of Q that sits in here. It's the covariant derivative of Q that sits in here. So this would give log divergent tension for the string. Because the integral of dx1, dx2 mod dq squared diverges with the infrared part. So to keep a finite energy density, to keep a finite tension for the string, you've got to turn on the theta component of the gauge field in order that Invariant derivative goes as 1 over r squared rather than, than 1 over r. In other words, the, the asymptotic part of the gauge field has to cancel the leading order piece from the derivative. Okay, in fact, what you need to do You need to turn on the gauge field. A i is i goes from one to two, so this is the gauge field in a plane, which takes the following form, where f has to go to zero at infinity and to, uh, uh, to one at the origin. Okay. The point of doing this is that now we have the covariant derivative integrated over the plane being this. However, once we've turned on an a theta at infinity, this necessarily means we have a magnetic flux in the plane. Standard electrodynamic argument that tells us that the integral of B3 over the plane transverse to the vortex string 
is 2 pi. So somewhere in this plane, there's a magnetic flux going through. But you know from standard um, uh, electromagnetism that when you're in the Higgs phase where the photon is massive, the magnetic flux doesn't want to pass through there. So the magnetic flux is likely to pass through the middle where Q dips to zero and the photon is massless. Of course, that's what really happens in, uh, uh, in supercomputers. <coughs> Okay, so so far I've not told you anything about solutions, I've just told you about configurations. We can have this boundary condition of infinity where the Higgs field winds, that guarantees there's a magnetic flux somewhere. Now we should just sit down and solve the second order equations of motion that come from uh, this Lagrangian. And uh, we can at least sketch what the profiles look like. So this is what the profiles look like. Far away, the Higgs field is in its vacuum. As you come close to the origin of the string, it dips down and hits zero. And uh, this is the, the screening length uh, of the superconductor. Um, in, the other, uh, uh, in the other situation, the B field rises precisely in the origin. OK, uh, an interesting fact that I always find a, a little strange. Um, no one knows what the analytic solutions of, uh, of this vortex is, even in, in the radially symmetric case. Right? It's not a big deal, right? We're just not very good at solving partial differential equations. And you can plot trivially on a computer. But I always think it's a little enigmatic because we have much harder partial differential equations involving many more variables in many more dimensions for, say, instantons or top polyatomic monopoles. And yet there we can, we can solve them beautifully. They have these lovely integrability properties. Here, even when lambda is equal to 1, which is the special supersymmetric limit, there's still no analytic solution for this. I kind of always find that a little, a little strange. OK, I should say that actually in the case lambda equals to 1, there is an analytic solution for how this, or an analytic estimate for how the vortex approaches the vacuum that the only way you can get is by the t-duality between the NS5 brain and uh, an ALE space using string theory duality. Uh, no one knows how It's kind of strange. OK, so this is the vortex stream. Oh, so when you, when you do, um, you know, I told you vortices are everywhere. So when, when you do t-duality of the NS5 brain, if you naively do it, so let's go the other way. Let's start with Taub nut space. Do t-duality of Taub nut space. If you naively do it, you get a smeared NS5 brain around the circle. That's not the right answer. The right answer is that the NS5 brain is localized somewhere. So you need to find a mechanism to localize the NS5 brain. The answer is that there's wall sheet instantons which kick in on the string, which cause the localization. Those wall sheet instantons in a gauge linear signal model are really vortices. And if you really want to get the NS5 brain solution on the nose, the only thing you need to know about the vortex profile is the asymptotic falloff of this field. And the asymptotic falloff of this field has to have a coefficient, which is the fourth root of 8, in order for string theory duality to work. So the fourth root of 8 is 1.683 dot, 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 People sat down on a computer, looked at the profile of the vortex, 1.683 dot. So it, it, it works, but it's kind of a mystery. OK. OK, so the tension of the vortex is obviously the integral of the energy density over the plane transverse to the vortex. And it's roughly equal to 2 times pi times 
times v squared. Now, there's a very slow dependence on this coefficient lambda, um, but as I'm now going to set lambda equal to 1, I'm not going to write that too much. Okay, so I'm flying through this because I'm guessing it's, it's kind of fairly elementary, right? Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so something special happens when this coefficient lambda is equal to one. Notice the lambda is the difference between um, when the Higgs field drops down and when the, uh, the gauge field uh, drops up. This is because this is the mass of the photon and this is the mass of the Higgs field. So when lambda is equal to one, the mass of the Higgs field is the same as the mass of the photon. And that's the limit where this Lagrangian admits a supersymmetric completion. Okay, it was just a boson in Lagrangian, but it's only when lambda equals to one you can write down uh, some fermion terms to make the whole thing supersymmetric. Okay, so something special. <sighs> Happens. When lambda is equal to one, the Lagrangian becomes Super symmetry <laughs> And what's more, the vortex is PPS. And so first order PDs instead of uh, second order equations of motion. So this is exactly the same as what we saw for the Yang-Mills instanton before. The Yang-Mills instanton satisfies the f equals star f first order equation. You don't have to solve the full second order equations. So what I'd now like to do is, in this special case where lambda is equal to 1, show you, using the Bogomolny argument, how you derive the first order equations for, for the vortex. Yeah, in front of the Higgs potential was a coefficient lambda e squared over 2. So the lambda, sorry, who was? Yeah, uh, so you said that lambda. Oh, I'll write down the energy functional now. So. Okay, so let's make everything independent of time and independent of the third direction along which the vortex stretches from now. Set the gauge potential to zero, then the energy, or I guess I should say the tension of the string, is you integrate over the plane transverse to the string. And again, there was a lambda in here before, but it's now been set equal to one. And what I'm about to do, you can only do when lambda is equal to one. OK, so what you've got to do is find a way. This is always the trick with the Bogomoli argument. You've got to find a way to rewrite this action as a sum of squares plus some extra terms that will be topological, meaning they'll just uh, depend on particular topological charges of your configuration of affinity. So it's a little tricky here. It was actually done in the original Bogomoli paper by Bogomoli. So, how does it work? Well, what you do is you, you pair this guy up with this guy. So you write um, some 1 over 2 e squared there. b3 minus e squared, q squared minus b squared. And then you pair these two guys, this is covariant derivative one and covariant derivative two up with themselves. Okay, so what do we have here? When we square this, we get this back. When we square this, we get this back. Obviously, when we square this and this, we get the kinetic terms. But now we have the cross terms that we have to worry about. So let's subtract off the cross terms.
Okay, so these are the, the cross terms. But when you add them back in, give you back, back this action. Okay, and now we're going to just do an integration by parts on this, this term here. So, so I guess we'll say last term. Okay, so to get that, I've just done. Uh, two integration by parts to put all the derivatives on the q's rather than the q daggers. I've thrown away the surface terms. You can show they, they don't contribute in this, in this limit. Um, but now I've got a covariant derivatives of, uh, sorry, a commutation of covariant derivatives. And that, of course, is equal to the magnetic field. So what I get is that this term here cancels this part of this term there. Okay. What I'm left with, noticing that these are total squares, so they're always greater than zero, is that the tension is greater than V3 uh, times V squared. Okay. okay, but V squared is a constant, and the integral of V3 over this plane is precisely what I told you had to be 2 pi. Uh, by the, uh, the fact that you need to turn on the gauge field to cancel the winding and infinity. Okay. Uh, by a single vortex, I mean that I, I assumed the, uh, the Higgs field winding only once in infinity. Of course, I could make it wind k times, and I just get a factor of k. OK. So uh, we have the first order vortex equations. So we use the usual Bogomoli argument, the tension in this topological sector is always bounded by this. However, if we can saturate that, we're guaranteed to have found the minimum energy solution within that topological sector. So it has to be a solution to the equations of motion. And the way we saturate that is making sure that these complete squares here are identically equal to zero. So that gives us the vortex equations. And D1Q equals I D2Q. Okay. okay, so these are the analog of what we saw in the first lecture, the F equals star F. Remember there it was trivial to show that F equals star F solves the second order equations in motion. It follows just from the Bianchi identity. Here it's it's not hard, but you know, you've got to do a page of algebra just to show that these also that the solutions to these equations are guaranteed to be solutions to the second order equations. Okay. It would also be much harder if you were just looking at the second order equations to notice that you can integrate them up once to get the first order. But this neat little Bogomoli trick here is, uh, is very useful. Okay, so are there any uh, any questions? I, I should say what I was saying before. There's also no known analytic solution to these first order equations. Okay, questions? <laughs> Too easy, huh? Okay. Good, good. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is tell you about um, uh, low energy dynamics of the vortex. And uh, what can this vortex do? Well, frankly, it can't do very much. It's kind of a boring object. It's a long, infinitely straight string, and what it can do is wobble this way and wobble this. Way. Okay. 
take that. It has other modes. If you're willing to excite photons, it can squeeze itself, but they're very massive modes, so they're not infinitely long wavelength. The infinitely arbitrarily long wavelength modes are just small fluctuations. So the low energy dynamics of the vortex, well, it's a string and a very long, ener uh, long wavelength or low energies. It's got to be described by the Nambu Goto action. There's nothing else it can be. If I expand this out in a derivative expansion, and just look at very small velocities, it's simply a free field theory describing motion this way and motion this way. Okay? It's really very dull indeed. So now let me tell you something that makes this, uh, this vortex a little more interesting. Okay. Non-abelian theories. So everything I did so far was, was just for a U1 theory, the theory that describes the superconductor. Um, let's do exactly the same, but look not in U1 theories, but in UN theories. So UN gauge group. With NF fundamental scales. So this is the Lagrangian. I goes from 1 to nf. Each of these is in the fundamental representation of, of the gauge group. Let me call this unc, actually. Uh, this uh, you should recognize as the d term from supersymmetry. So although I'm just writing down the bosonic action, I always have in the back of my mind that I'm going to make this supersymmetric. So, so just notice the, the structure here. This is the standard d term structure. I haven't got a q dagger q to form a singlet. I can q and q dagger back to back, so that this whole thing is an NC by NC matrix. This V squared here comes with an implicit unit NC by NC matrix. So this whole thing is an equation. You square it, then you take the trace. OK, what's, uh, what's the vacuum of this theory? Well, remember from uh, Ken's lectures, there, there's this uh, uh, rank condition. If you want to set this equal to zero to get a supersymmetric vacuum, this is rank NC, but this is um, uh, at most rank NF. So you've got to have NF greater than or equal to NC in order to be able to set this to zero and have a, uh, a supersymmetric vacuum. Uh, so what I'm going to assume throughout these lectures is that NF equals NC equals N. So there's a generalization to everything I say for NF greater than NC, but not for NF less than NC. So the vacuum is very simple. It's just, so this I index here is the, is the flavor index. This A index is the color index. Of course, they're both equal to N. So this is really an N by N matrix. And you just make it equal to V in, in this way. Okay, now we have the vortex equations. You can complete the square in exactly the same way you did before. You get exactly the same equations you had before, except now the interpretation is a little different. This is an n by n matrix. This is an n by n matrix. And uh, this is a, a, a also an n by n matrix or, or n uh, objects in the fundamental of the UN. Okay. okay. 
So we have to solve these. I should say that people looked at vortices. Nielsen Olsen, who first wrote down the U1 abelian Higgs model vortex, was, was also 1973, the same year as Atom 43. Um, and then people looked at vortices for 30 years, but nobody wrote down this non abelian vortex model until three years ago. Uh, I don't know why, people just missed it somehow. I mean, there was so much work on supersymmetric solitons that nobody ever looked at supersymmetric vortices in non abelian things. Okay, so. These are the equations we have to solve, but there's a really trivial way to, to solve them, which is you take the solution to the abelian vortex and you just plug it into this, this n by n matrix. So the vortex lives in an n by n matrix. the number of colors is equal to the number of flavors, both the gauge field and the Higgs field are n by n matrices. So, so I can embed the abelian vortex <laughs> so let me call those B star and Q star. I can just embed them in these in this n by n matrix in any way. I choose, choose to embed them just, just in the upper left hand corner. Everything here is zero. Here I've got a row of V's on the diagonal because that was uh, the vacuum that I, I had to choose. Okay. And this Q star tends towards V as infinity, albeit winding. Okay, but then we have a story that's very similar from what we saw for the instantons. I, I chose to embed it in the upper left hand corner, but I could have embedded it anywhere I like. So the vortex should pick up some um, orientational mode that tells you how it sits in this, this gauge group and actually also in, in the flavor group. So we can embed in different ways. How do we embed in different ways? Well, we do exactly what we did for uh, the instanton. We notice that we have an SUN symmetry which can rotate this into other parts of the matrix, but most of that SUN symmetry just, just doesn't happen. So the different embeddings are described by SUN, which is uh, the symmetry that will rotate that out of the top left-hand corner, divided by the things that don't act at all, which are the uh, SUN parts that, that hit the bottom right hand corner, so the SUN minus one parts, and a relative U1 that hits the, the, the top left and the bottom. Okay. But this is something very familiar. This is simply the complex projective space uh, CPN minus one. Okay, so now I can ask the same question I asked before. I have this infinitely straight vortex string, 
and I want to know how it can uh, oscillate at a very long wavelengths or low energy. So it can still go backwards and forwards, but now it has something else it can do, which is that as you move along the string, it can slowly rotate itself inside the gauge. And so the picture you should have in mind is that you have some vortex string like this that can slowly oscillate backwards and forwards, but that at every point it has an arrow that points somewhere to on this uh, CPN minus one manifold. And as you move along, this arrow can very slowly change. Okay, so what we have essentially is the low energy dynamics of this vortex in this non-abelian theory has this trivial fluctuation backwards and forwards, but it also has something like spin waves as you move along it that tells you how this vortex moves in the future. Okay, so these are the orientation modes. Okay, so we want to write down the dynamics of this string, which is going to be the trivial thing, plus the CPN sigma model. So I'm going to write this CPN sigma model as what's called uh, a gauge linear model. Okay, so these are the first oscillations. They're, they're, they're totally free and completely boring. Uh, this is a Lagrange multiplier. I've called it D because it really is going to be the D term of supersymmetry in uh, subsequent <laughs> applications. And this imposes the constraint that I need on the phi that I wrote on the, the first board, which is that the sum of the phi i squared is equal to r. I had equal to 1 before, but I'm just, I just uh, changed the normalization from the kinetic term. Even more. These guys So what I've done is made all of these phi i's charged under a U1 gauge field. This is just an auxiliary U1 gauge field that I've, I've introduced. It has the sole purpose of guaranteeing that any phi i's related by an overall shift are to be identified because that's a gauge symmetry. So that, that's a redundancy of this, this description on the world sheet. But the two constraints that phi i squared equals r modulo this is precisely the definition of CPN. So CPN minus one. Okay, so this is the dynamics of the vortex the only thing I need to tell you is what this guy here is. Okay, this is the size of uh, CPN minus one. And that just requires a calculation. And it turns out it's given by, by the following. E squared is the, um, uh, uh, is the gauge coupling constant in four dimensions. Okay, let, let me just make an observation here. When E squared in four dimensions is very small, the theory is weakly coupled. But then R is very big, so the world sheet theory is also weakly coupled. So the duality I'm about to tell you isn't some strong weak coupling duality. Uh, when the 4D theory is weakly coupled, the world sheet theory is weakly coupled, and uh, the matching is going to be uh, is going to happen in regimes where you can really trust both calculations simultaneously. Okay, are there any questions about about this? <coughs> Okay, so, so what have we seen? We've seen um, a UN gauge theory, a single vortex has uh, two times n 
bosonic zero modes. Two of those are just the transverse fluctuations. Two times n minus one of them are the orientational modes that parameterize where it sits in the gauge group somewhere on this, this CPN minus one. Okay, so, so now we can ask the following question. Suppose I have k vortices. So I hate to go to y is k times the infinity. Um, how many zero modes are k vortices? And you can figure it out. You can do the index theorem calculation, something like the Atiyah Singer index theorem. And it turns out there's two times k times n zero modes for uh, uh, for the uh, for the vortices. So so for k vortices. Un two times k times n collected coordinates. That is parameters of the, of the system. Okay, so this should this should ring a bell. Remember, if you have instantons in um, in a un gauge theory, you have four times k times n collected coordinates. Now, for these vortices, we're seeing two uh, times k times n. So, is there uh, any relationship there? Well, it turns out there is, and, and no one really knows why, which is, which is it's kind of surprising. And there's various physical reasons that I understand this, but as far as I know, there's no deep mathematical reason. The, the statement is the following. You take the instanton moduli space, k instantons in UN gauge theory, 4 times k times n. If you look at a particular middle dimensional uh, Kähler submanifold of that, in fact, it's a special Lagrangian submanifold. That special Lagrangian submanifold is really the vortex moduli space, dimension 2 times k times n. So the moduli space of vortices sits embedded inside the moduli space of Yang Mills instantons. Now, it's not at all clear why that would be. If you look at the equations that I wrote down for the vortices, they look nothing like f equals star f. You can't get from uh, one set of equations to the other. It's very hard to see how you get from one set of solutions to the other. They involve very different fields, right? These have guys in the fundamental representation. Um, uh, yet nonetheless, this vortex moduli space sits there nestled inside the yang milton instanton moduli space. Um, and like I said, I don't think there's really a very, very good understanding of this. Uh, I have some ideas um, physically about what's going on, but nothing more than that. I should just make a comment. Be 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 behind some of the stuff I'm going to tell you about tomorrow is precisely this fact. And um, for those of you who ever read Necrosoft's papers on, on understanding uh, cyborg Witten theory by explicitly doing the instanton calculation, what he does is he takes the instanton moduli space and puts two potentials on it. Uh, and those potentials localize into points. If you were to just put one of those potentials that he chooses uh, uh, on the instanton moduli space, you get localized to precisely this vortex moduli space. Now, the key to cyborg witten theory is that when you do the instanton computations, you only pick up contributions from the zeros of that potential. All the zeros of that potential live in the vortex moduli space. And that's somehow the reason why there's uh, a map between 2D theories and 4D theories. As well. OK, so I understand that's a bit cryptic for anybody who hasn't read Necrosoft. It's just for, for the experts. OK, what to do? I have, I have 20 minutes. Let me tell you something um, I always think is, is, is quite, quite cute. Um, you know, if you want to quantize strings, right, real fundamental strings, in, in flat space, not in the lovely things that Eva's doing, but really in flat space, you know very well that quantum strings can only exist in, uh, in flat dimensions, right, because, uh, because of anomaly cancellation, or the vial anomaly. Um, and yet here we have perfectly well-defined quantum theory, give or take a Landau fold, you won't worry about. Um, and it's, um, it has objects which are string-like, which at low energies obey the Nambu-Goto action, and uh, which are quite happy to be quantum objects. So what, what's going on here? Why, when I quantize the string, do I not have to worry about the usual vial anomaly uh, issues that, um, that were appearing before? Well, um, there's several answers to this, but the quickest answer is that these strings are not weakly coupled by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and what I'd like to do now is show you why they're not weakly coupled. So what, what does weak coupling mean? Weak coupling means um, physically, if I take two strings and I pass them through each other, if they're weakly coupled, more times than not, they just move, uh, keep moving and don't see each other. In fact, with a probability proportional to, to g string squared. 
However, if they're strongly coupled, um, it's a bit hard to do with my hands, but they, they, they come together like this, and what happens is they reconnect. This guy here uh, meets this elbow, and this guy here meets this elbow, and they kind of move like this. So let me now show you, um, just from what we've learned so far, why these strings are necessarily strongly coupled, meaning they always do this with probability one. Okay. And uh, there's rather a cute Uh, there's rather a cute um, explanation of this, due, due, I think, originally to Neil Chorak and Ed Copeland in, in the 1980s. Um, the argument is the following. We've got some moduli space for these vortices, and it's dimension 2 times k times n. So let's just look in the U1 theory. You can redo this in the UN theory, actually. You surprisingly, don't get, uh, you get exactly the same results. At least it surprised me when I did the calculation. But now let's do the U1 theory. So we look at two vortices. And first, let's think about vortices on the plane. So forget that these are strings. Let's go to a 2 plus 1 dimensional theory. Think about vortices just, just moving on the plane. OK. So two vortices in V equals 2 plus 1 dimensions. OK. So here's one vortex, and here's another vortex. And firstly, I'm going to ask, what happens when I, when I push these guys towards each other? Well, what do I? What do I know about these objects? Let, let's look at the, uh, the moduli space. So the moduli space is dimension uh, 2 times 2 times 1, which is 4. And there's a very natural interpretation of this 4, which, which is the correct interpretation. It's that this vortex can sit anywhere it likes, and this vortex can sit anywhere it likes, and there's not going to be any force between them. Okay, so there's solutions for all possible separations of, of these vortices. So what's the moduli space? The moduli space. is equal to uh, C, which is the center of mass of these guys, times C, which is the separation of these guys, except there's a Z2. And that Z2 is, is all important. Uh, what's the Z2? The point is that these are just classical solutions that I'm interested in. This is the modular space of classical solutions. And so as far as classical solutions are concerned, these objects are really uh, indistinguishable, meaning that this solution is exactly the same as as this solution. Okay, I've got no way to tell a hand in the solution which is which. There's no labels on, on these vortices. So the moduli space is this. Okay, so this is this is C, which is just the overall motion. And C mod Z2 looks roughly like this. Except this this can't be right because here there's a singularity which sits the top of the moduli space. And yet when these two solitons come close together, there's nothing at all singular that happens. The solutions remain smooth for all values of, of the separation. In particular, if you put them bang on top of each other, so the two zeros of the Higgs fields really coincide, it's a smooth solution. So what actually happens is that the moduli space gets smoothed off like this. Okay, It's a smooth cone. Asymptotically, it's C mod Z2. But around here, the smoothing is of order 1 over E squared V squared, which is this, the mass of the photon of this. I guess it's EV. OK, so at some distance scale of order 1 over EV, <coughs> um, the modular space is smooth. OK, what does that mean for the dynamics? Suppose I take these two objects and I just kick them towards each other. Well, they move towards each other. They trace some path on the modular space. You know, there's some assumption of slow motion or adiabaticity here, in the sense that, that I kick them towards each other. If I was to just take a photo, they'd look roughly stationary. I wouldn't see lots of radiation being spewed off or anything like this. OK, so they move towards each other. In the moduli space, they hit the top, and everything is nice and smooth, so they just roll down the other side of the cone. What does this mean in the real world? Well, if you normally, if you smash particles together, no matter how slowly, if you have a zero impact parameter, they hit and they bounce off. But this doesn't happen here. Hitting and bouncing off would be moving up here and then coming back down again because, like I said, this configuration is the same as this configuration. So what does this really mean? When you come back around the other side, what's happening is uh, the vortices come together and then they scatter at right. Okay, so the vortices come together and they leave 
right angle. So this kind of right angle scattering is, 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 is rather counterintuitive. And it, you know, Newton would say it, it couldn't happen, it would violate uh, conservation of angular momentum. Uh, what's happening is the vortices carry their own angular momentum because they have uh, little Q fields winding around them and B fields and, and everything is, is nuts. Okay, so th this is um, this scattering at right angles is one of the uh, defining features of actually nearly all solitons, but in particular vortices on the plane. Okay, what does this have to do with uh, the coupling of strings? Imagine now that I take two vortex strings. Like this. And I start move pushing the vortex strings to, towards each other. Well, let me look at the plane in where they'll intersect. So here's, here's one guy and here's the other. On that plane, it's going to look exactly like what happens here. Okay. What does that mean? It means that uh, this vortex is going to go in there and this vortex is uh, uh, it's going to come in here. And afterwards, I'm going to find a vortex heading this way and the vortex moving out this way. Now, how can that be? If they were just to pass through each other, um, obviously, they'd keep going. That doesn't happen. What's really happening here is that Actually, you can you can build slices where you you move up slowly and slowly. You always look at what's happening on the plane. But what's happening is that which one's joined which one? Yeah. So that afterwards, this string here has joined this string here. This string here has joined this string here, and they're moving apart in this way. Okay, so this follows simply from this, uh, this fact that these objects are indistinguishable and smooth as they come together. You're guaranteed that you always get this reconnection between strings, and they're always strongly coupled. Um, there, is a ca there are a couple of caveats here. Everything is classical for a start. Um, Quantum effects, at least for small g squared, can't possibly spoil, spoil this. Um, uh, for large e squared gauge coupling constant, you run into the Landau pole and the problem becomes essentially uh, ill-defined. So uh, you've got to worry about that. Also, it's only for slow motion. To answer this at higher speed, you have to do numerical simulations. And it turns out that up to very high speeds of about 0.99, things always uh, reconnect from this fashion. OK, so that was a small diversion. Um, any questions about that? Yes. These don't have to live in their dimensions because they're different. Because they don't have a problem. Yeah. Remind me maybe. So, I can ask them regular strings. Where you still get the economic calculation happening. Well, you're always assuming weak coupling as soon as you're doing a well-sheet calculation. Where it affects. It, it's. Oh, I, I, I see. But if you're if you're really doing. Okay, yeah. There, there's a there's a few different ways to, to say this, I suppose. Um, yeah, and if you're really doing string theory as in summing over all uh, genus worlds, you've got to be at, at weak coupling for it to make any sense at all. So that, 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 that's one thing. However, you, you, could, you could also ask the question, well, this has to be at low energies uh, um, a, uh, a, a reparameterization invariant quantum field theory of, of a string. Let me take an infinite model. And you could worry what's going wrong in, in that argument. And the answer to that is that the string is actually also finite thickness. And so when you go to higher and higher energies, um, you need to include extra relevant terms on the, on the, uh, in the theory that, um, that account for that. So there's actually a nice paper where, by Strominger and Polchinski, which I think is kind of an underappreciated paper because it happened about a month before the string revolution. So nobody ever went back and, and, and looked at this. Um, but they, they show how the Nambu-Goto action for these vortex strings can be changed by higher dimension operators and evade these, uh, these problems. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. uh, one over n squared is the probability of reconnection. Right. Yeah. But they're also thick objects, and they're also so. I mean, it, it seems like it seems like the the, the difference between ten dimensions and crystal strings and so on does have more to do with the with thickness, the thickness than than, than, the, than the probability of reconnection. Of reconnection. Yeah, no, that, that that seems seems fair. Okay. Good. So I, I want to make a few comments about. Um, what happens with fermions? So this is uh, an old lovely story due to, to, to Keeve and Reddy, um, uh, which, which has lo lots of applications in, in various contexts, um, including, as I've been learning this week, uh, lots of applications in lattice gauge theory that are still quite poorly understood. Um, the basic point is that if we throw fermions into a theory that has a topological object, uh, then uh, there are zero modes of the fermions that, that, that live on the object. So you get essentially massless fermions running up and down the string in, in this case. So I have uh, 10 minutes. And one of the things I was planning to do was, let me, let me not do it. Let me just e explain how it's done. It, it, it's in the notes. Um, the basic question is one of chirality. Solitons are a lovely way to get uh, chiral fermions in low dimensions from high dimensions. Um, and what happens is you take, a, you take the Dirac equation in four dimensions in this case, and you try and solve it in the background of a vortex. But the vortex has, um, has broken parity. I think this is really the, 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 the key observation here. And so when you solve for... Um, uh, for the fermion zero modes in the background of the vortex, you find that uh, they run essentially only in one direction. They run uh, this away. And uh, well, let, let me let me just tell you the the, the punchline, and, and then, then I can maybe uh, elaborate some more. So. Adding fermions. So what I'm actually going to be interested in the next two lectures are uh, four-dimensional n equals one SQCD. Uh, and again, I'm going to put nf equals to nc in both cases. And 4d n equals two SQCD with nf equals to nc. And in each case, I'm interested in what the vortex, what the theory on uh, the vortex wall sheet is. And let me tell you the answer. So I've told you the bosonic sector already. It's always the CPN sickle model. But what kind of fermions you have in are crucial for determining uh, the low energy physics of the CPN model, just as they're crucial for determining uh, the low energy physics of the Yang Mills theory. So. So here's uh, the, two, uh, the two sigma models. What I've written here is the amount of supersymmetry, which tells you the amount of fermions. So let me just write down exactly uh, what these objects are. The zero two theory is given by the following Lagrangian. So what I get here are some right-moving fermions on the world sheet, which I call uh, Xi i, uh, Xi plus and Xi minus. The i runs from 1 to n, just as it does here. Um, and so these are the 
so if I've got some left moving left and right moving fermions. Um, this is the constraint that tells me that this is the CPA model and not just some free theory. And these objects here are Grassmann Lagrange multipliers. which fix the right moving fermions to live in the tangent bundle of, of, of CPM. That's what this, uh, this constraint is here. But notice that there's uh, no restriction on the left moving fermion. So in that sense, this is a chiral theory on the world sheet. The right moving fermions and the left moving fermions uh, have different dynamics. If I'm in a two two, if I'm in the n equals two theory, I have two two supersymmetry. And this is exactly the same as the zero two model. But I pick up and also a constraint on the left moving fermions. Okay, so I introduce a new oh, bah, 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 that should be a plus. A new Lagrange multiplier here, which says that the left moving fermions also live in the tangent bundle. And then I also pick up another auxiliary field that I call sigma. So for those of you who know the 2-2 uh, the, the vector multiplet contains a complex scalar field called sigma. So that's this guy here. It's not there in the 0-2 theory. And it couples in the following way. It couples to the phi i's uh, like this and it couples to the fermions, that these are the dynamical fermions of a world sheet. If I was to integrate out sigma, this would give me a four fermion interaction term living on the world sheet of the string. Okay? Okay, so the 0-2 theory and the 2-2 two -two theory have the same matter content, but slightly different interactions. This has restrictions just on the right moving fermions. This has restrictions also on the left moving fermions and the four fermion interaction. Okay, so these are the two theories on the vortex. Let me just uh, tell you what we're going to learn in the next two lectures. Okay, so what do we know about the 4D physics in both of these cases? Um, so we're going to be looking at in the next two lectures is quantizing the vortex string. So let me tell you what we know about the 4D physics. Well, for n equals 2, everything we know comes from the solution of Seiberg and Witten. We know the theory doesn't confine for n equals 2. We know uh, the low energy interactions. Encoding in what's called the cyborg wooden curve. We know the exact spectrum of BPS states. That's the exact qu uh, quantum formulas for the masses of BPS states. And we know there are special superconformal points, called RGSW's points, where we know uh, the dimensions of all chiral primary operators. Okay. For the uh, n equals one theory, right over here, so for the n equals one theory, we know slightly less. We know the theory does confine, and we know something about the mechanism of confinement due to cyber called the quantum modified moduli space, which I'll tell you about on Friday, and it's summarised for those who know by this equation. <coughs> Okay, so what I want to tell you is that, is that from this theory and this theory on the world sheet, we can recapture all of this information, okay? This exact information. Uh, we can see the, uh, the quantum numbers of the spectrum and see it doesn't confine. The cyborg wicken curve in the two two cases living in the twisted superpotential. Um, it turns out rather remarkably that the exact BPS mass spectrum of this theory, that's the spectrum of kinks, and of elementary fluctuations agrees exactly with the BPS mass spectrum of the four dimensional theory. You can tune the 4D theory to a superconformal point, and you'll find that the world sheet theory of the string is superconformal, so the whole spectrum of chiral primary operators. Similarly, if you look just at the 0 2 theory, 
you can show the 4D theory confines, and you can also, importantly, reproduce up to a coefficient here, which I just haven't been that careful about, um, uh, this cyber quantum form of modular space. Okay, so today's lecture has been kind of pedestrian, sorry if I bored you, but the idea was to derive the fact that the vortex string has the CPN sigma model with some particular fermion content and interactions that depends on whether you have n equals 1 or n equals 2 supersymmetry in four dimensions. And the next two lectures, next one I'll tell you about how you capture all of this physics from the 2-2 model, and in Friday's lecture I'll tell you how you capture uh, these physics in, in the 0-2. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you.